Hola, hola, buenos días a todos y gracias por lo que llegaron tan temprano. Bueno, es un honor para mí eh, hablar de Manfred y con mucho cariño. Manfred está con nosotros prácticamente al principio de lo que era el diplomado y ahora el postítulo. Eso hace casi 20 años, o oh, ya más de 20 años. Nosotros partimos con él, con un proyecto profo en el año 2000. Él nos acompañó a la fecha. Eh, claro, era presencial. Ahora, bueno, eh, nos estamos acostumbrando porque él vive en Alemania. Ya se complicaba que viniera a Chile, pero pienso yo que el próximo postítulo lo podamos tener en Chile. Es mucho más cálido estar cerca de las personas. Bueno, eh, eh, Manfred eh, fue el que nos impulsó realmente lo importante que era. Porque nuestro proyecto era prepararnos con la 15189, era el año 2000. Y esta preparación exigía una serie de requisitos. Y nosotros habíamos solo trabajado con la gestión y Manfred nos preguntó, bueno, ¿qué pasa con la parte analítica? Uh, estábamos bastante mal. Casi no había control de calidad interno. La, los profesionales no tenían controles. Ni si, y los pocos que tenían, tenían un solo control. Trabajamos mucho. En ese entonces no se conocía la norma, no la teníamos homologada en español. Y la verdad es que el impulso de Manfred cuando dijo, oh, ¿qué pasa con la parte analítica? Veamos, partamos con el control de calidad interna. Ustedes comprenderán que algo se puede hacer. Todos ustedes tienen control de calidad interna, tienen dos controles saben cómo gestionarlo. Y con eso nos sentimos bien pagados. Creo que en Chile no queda ningún laboratorio que no haga su control de calidad externa. Y por eso es para nosotros un honor tener a Manfred. La hija, la hijita, no ahora es hija, de Manfred, eh, ustedes lo van a ver. Ella eh, se gestó en Chile y nació en Alemania. Y uno de los ausentes, que recordamos con mucha pena, hace casi una semana que se despidió de nosotros, que murió. Él fue el impulsor, junto conmigo, de aquel proyecto maravilloso que fue el Prof. Bueno, Manfred, si ustedes quieren, véanlo. Abare, sí, solo con Google y van a ver eh, dónde aparece. Él eh, partió como consultor que nos ayudó mucho el PTD, PTB. Eh, lo va a tratar de decir en alemán. Es fisicalista, técnico, Bundestag. Es pésimo mi alemán, pero así se llama. Es una de las instituciones metrológicas más de más peso en Europa. Así que ellos nos ayudaron mucho. También gracias al PTV. No, no voy a seguir porque le quito tiempo a la conferencia de Manfred. Perdonen, yo soy muy adicta a la historia, pero bueno que lo sepan. Bueno, los dejo con ustedes a nuestro amigo Manfred Kinder. Empezar Manfred. Okay, Manfred, you, you can start. Okay. Buenos días. Buenos días, Milena. Buenos días, Carlos. Buenos días, damas y caballeros. And now I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish and I don't understand much Spanish, so I have to continue in English. 
and give me one minute for a commemoration because a few days ago, I got an email from Milena Monari that Leonardo Rubio Figueroa uh, died. And I'm so sorry about this because I have a personal relation to him. And I will explain. 20 years ago, we started with the project of Melina, the Corfo project, and Alakin in the laboratory Wexler 2002. And we made internal audits, and the goal was to make 14 laboratories, clinical laboratories, fit for the international accreditation. And then uh, Leonardo Rubio got a special relation to my family because one year later, my daughter was born and we are absolutely unexpected, uh, received a painting from Rubio, uh, Leonardo Rubio about this photo. And so you can see my wife with my daughter, Milena. And today, every day, we can see this painting in our bedroom. And so we have in mind this Leonardo Rubio. Um, and so we are very sorry. Leonardo, I try to speak a little bit Spanish. Las buenas personas son como las estrellas. Brian mucho después de apagarse. And yes, with best regards from my family in Werner, Germany. And here you can see now the two ladies 20, nearly 20 years later. Thank you very much for this. And so now let's start with my lecture, quality and risk management in clinical laboratories. And I'm very happy to talk with you about my experiences, not only in Chile, in also a lot of other countries of the world. So normally risk management, you know, quality management is not so difficult. Look at the rules, the fundamentos de la gestión de riesgos. Don't do anything wrong today. Second, don't do anything wrong tomorrow. And third, repeat, repeat it. And so el camino a seguir está claro. And look at here, I try again my Spanish. Parece que el jefe ha terminado de establecer la nueva normativa de gestión de riesgos. So you can see the 10 commitments and you will see regulations, a rule book. And so the question always is, is it sufficient to create a quality documentation, the quality manual to create a living quality management system. And to analyze the quality systems, um, internal audits or assessments, I will present you now seven quality tools which I use in all activities of assessment and analysis of laboratory systems worldwide. So my first quality tool number one is based on the ISO 9001 with a version of 2015. And you will find there a special rule, the risk-based thinking. Be aware, it's risk-based thinking and to have risk in mind. And this was one of the nine main changes of this version, the actual version of ISO 9001, the quality management standard. 
And here you will find the risk-based thinking to support and improve the understanding and the application of the process approach. What is written in the annex number four about risk-based thinking? The concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit in previous editions of this international standard. For example, through requirements for planning, review and improvement. This international standard specifies requirements for the organization to understand its context and to determine risks as a basis for planning. This represents the application of risk-based thinking to planning and implementing quality management system processes and will assist in determining the extent of documented information. So this is my first tool to use this standard ISO 9001, which is a basement of all connected ISO standards for laboratories, testing laboratories, calibration laboratories, also clinical laboratories, certification bodies, and inspection bodies. So the next tool, number two, is using the Deming cycle, which is called the plan, to do, to check, and to act an activity. And it's also implemented in the structure of the ISO 9001. And you will find this in all chapters. You can see the green one is plan, the blue ones is do, the yellow ones is check, and the red ones are act. And you will find also in the check part, the internal audit and connected to this, the management review. So let's have a look to the scheme um, where the Demings PDCA plan, do, check, act cycle is implemented. We have the customer requirements and we have to look for the organization and its context. And uh, also connected to the customer requirements are the needs and expectations of relevant interested parties. So we start with planning, we support, we need operation, we do something, we have to evaluate the performance and to improve as a check act activity. And everything is connected with leadership. And the goal is a customer satisfaction with the results of our activities, of our products and services. And there's a special standard ISO 31000 from 2018 about risk management. And let's have a look for uh, some statement which is very important now for our activity today. Managing risk considers the external and internal context of the organization, including human behavior and cultural factors. And exactly this is my challenge to work in a lot of other countries which have different culture and also different mentality than in Germany or in Chile, for example. So let's have a look for the next quality tool, number three, which I use. I call it the ripoff analysis. What does it mean? It's a simplified uh, scheme of ISO 9001 because I have a special goal, KISS. Keep it smart and simple. Simplify a complex situation with such a diagram. So ripoff means we need the resources, the resources. We will have an input we have activity, the processo, and we will produce an output, and we will get the feedback from different parts of our activities. That means 
if you start with a test of a um, sample, the blood sample, for example, this is your input. You will check the input. You need the resources to uh, transportation and um, so on. Then you make the analysis and you will get a test report or a diagnosis and send it to the client or maybe to the hospital. And then you will get from different ways the feedback from the hospital, from the uh, uh, customer, or by the monitoring of the process, or um, later on from complaints and so on. And then you will react. So you have to improve the process, you have to repair maybe the input and so on. So this is very simple. You have to be uh, aware about five components, resources, input, processes, output, and feedback. And now we start with the risk analysis because we have in all activities on all points have to be, we will have uh, risks. Here you will find also the Deming um, cycle. We start with a plan, with the resources. We do our process, our uh, test. We check the results and we have to act for improvement. And this box, use, uh, I, I use it with the black and white box. I will present it later. By describing stress factors for each quality process and and represents, uh, represents the worst case scenarios for the risk analysis. So let me see uh, what is my method to analyze the risks in this uh, scheme. And that's why ah, I have to explain at first my worst case scenarios, which I use in all um, assessment and audit scenarios to check um, the performance of a quality management system. For example, I will tell you some examples. Here on the right side, you can see what that I hit the icon marked worst case scenario, but it's a fictive worst case scenario. It's not a reality, but you can now be and uh, you can now analyze and be prepared um, to deal with such a worst case scenarios. And I will give you some examples. For example, all lab data are lost by computer crime, cyber criminal, criminality. Or maybe you have a power uh, failure and your air condition was shut down in a laboratory which needs cooling service. Or a measuring device was decalibrated because it got a shock. Patient samples were contaminated or falsified test results were due to bribery. In a lot of countries, we have exactly this problem with uh, corruption and bribery. Or VIP test results from very important persons were sold to press reporters. What about the drug test of a prominent political um, child, for example? And the question now for me as an auditor, how are you prepared for these worst case scenarios? How do you prevent them with your risk management and also with your quality management? I will present you some risk. Uh, for example, here there was a ransomware attack worldwide, which has attacked more than 200,000 victims in 150 countries. There were open doors and windows everywhere, and they destroyed uh, the data on the computers. Another one is the problem that patient data have a gold value. And here is a statistic of uh, patient data which were lost or stolen. And uh, this but is 10 years ago. You see here the, uh, the data, the, the year of 2012. And you can see number two of this um, activities were the medical file. 
in 40 or 48 percent of the cases, the medical file was corrupted by hackers. And you can see the volume here, the one of 2.2 million affected individuals, or in the radiology regional center, nearly half a million individuals, and so on. So that means a lot of patient data now are visible in the internet and um, in the yeah in the, in the black side of the internet. Be aware about your medical files. Other uh, newspapers uh, have uh, some methods. Uh, 180,000 um, patient records um, was uh, hacked in aesthetic dentistry. Um, here we have uh, patient data of half a million children stolen from deterioration or the hack database of Anthem included 78 million people. So it's not a, a small activity which uh, destroys um, the patient data. And in 2017, also you could see the uh, darknet side. So um, a lot of data which were uh, published now and um, here is a statement, the entire brutal impact of the incident that resulted from poor cyber security and inadequate cyber hygiene on behalf of the healthcare organization is forced onto the shoulders of the victim to deal with the rest of their life. This is a disaster if something happens like this. And it's not finished, it's just working more and more in the world, in the cyber world. Okay, let's go now to the next quality tool number four. I call it, it's the iceberg model, the SPO analysis. What does it mean? Look at the iceberg. In the iceberg, you can see that only one seventh of the berg of the iceberg is visible. All the other parts are under the surface. And this was also the problem of the Titanic, uh, which were not aware about the invisible part of the iceberg. And let's say what is visible in your laboratory. This is a Calidad de Resultados. So we go deeper now, and under the surface, we will find the processes which produce these results. And going deeper, we will find the people, the process owner, which are responsible to do the work to produce the results. That's it's called the structure, the estructura. Here we will have the processors and the resultados. And now we detect non-conformities, observaciones. And now we have to look how it's possible that here on the surface, and it's visible, we find some non-conformities which are connected um, to the process, for example, or to the people. So we have to analyze um, all the non-conformities and we have to look for the connections is non-conformity number one connected with non-conformity number two? And much more. What are the processes which has produced these results? And of course, the processes are also connected. It's a chain of activities which produce these results. And here you can see the person. So we have to go deeper. Who is responsible, which person is responsible to work, to do the work, and which has maybe produced some critical results. So here we will have the risk, the risk on the structure level. So you have to be aware on this deepest level about your risk 
system. So, and I use now this uh, system, the structured process outcome analysis, uh, to identify the root cause of any quality deviation or to detect the weak points of a system on personal level. And to use these results for an effective risk management. And because I told you I will make it very simple, so one of the simple, most simplest rules rule is ask five times why. You have detected a finding, a nonconformity. <clears throat> the first question, why do we have something, a deviation here? Okay, maybe something was wrong with the process. Against us, why do we have a problem with our process? So you go deeper and you can see, ah, we have the problem with a user of this process, with the analyst or something. So we are on the structure level on the people. So the root cause, nearly all cases are people. And why these people could use such a problem on the process level or on the other outcome level, maybe it's a problem of qualification, of uh, motivation, and uh, overloaded with work or something like this. Yes. And now I talked about the black and white boxes. And this is my tool number five. How I analyze a laboratory or a company or a certification body or an accreditation body. I use the system analysis. <clears throat> the system analysis, the model is of any institution contains elements with defined relations inside of an organization, which will be permanently influenced by relations from outside. So here you can see such a border between um, the inside of a laboratory and the environment uh, to outside, to the market, to the rules, which uh, produce stress inside of the laboratory. We will have an owner. And if we look inside, we will have a head of the laboratories. We will have head of departments, a quality manager, and so on. And between each element, we will have special relations. And now we will look deeper. At first, we look outside the black box. This is black box describes the environment of the institution with all relations to external components. So we have a laptop, has a relation to the accreditation body, which is connected to the worldwide organization of ILAC. In your case, it's IAAC. We will have a relation to the government, which rules uh, all activities with legislation, which is maybe also contact, connected to the WTO, World Trade Organization. Your laboratory maybe is connected to the laboratory association, to client associations. Your laboratory will have competitors on the market, uh, you need calibration laboratory for your equipment, which is also connected to the National Metrology Institute, which is also connected to the worldwide organization for metrology. And your laboratory is connected to the national standard body, which uh, creates the ISO standards for the work of your laboratory. And here on the bottom, um, you will find the industry and the, um, the uh, research and development, uh, the trade, the importers, the consumers, the exporters. So that means that such an institution is surrounded by a lot of external uh, components which influence it. And let's look again to the ISO 31000 that was written, managing risk considers the external context of the organization. So this is my tool to look for the external context in the organization. This is a black box. The laboratory in the beginning is for me a black box. 
For example, uh, to have a look to the clinical laboratory, it's a little bit more complicated. We have the Ministry of Health. We have also standard bodies, accreditation bodies, metrology institutions. We will have maybe market surveillance, inspectors. Um, we have a connection to the manufacturers of equipment. Uh, we need training services. We have a connection in the market to competing laboratories with the hospitals, with the doc doctor's offices, with the patients, with the court, for example, with service providers for proficiency testing, for reference materials, for IT services, transportation, security services, cleaning services, waste disposal, and everything of this system is uh, financed by a taxpayer, by the society. So now we know uh, the influences of components outside, and now we want to open the box, because now the requirement of ISO 31000 is managing risk considers the internal context of the organization. So we look inside. So we have the market and the owner from outside and the client, uh, which gives you the orders. But inside we will have maybe a director, we have an administration, we have different departments with different employees, and we will have a quality manager. So, and this white box, because now it's not anymore black, uses organizational charts, job descriptions, and quality procedures to describe all actions inside of the black box. You can see again, here the elements and the relations to everybody. And the question is now, what is inside of this box? And I developed such a matrix of responsibility. <clears throat> this represents um, the structure, the process of the outcome components of my iceberg. So let's have a look. So, for example, we have the process of analysis of a blood sample. We have the structure. These are the people who are working inside of the laboratory. Here we have the owner, we have the head of laboratory, we have different heads of departments, we have the quality manager, the administration, we have technicians, and at the end we have the client. And all activities will produce an outcome, a result. It could be a letter, a protocol, a contract, a plan, or also a report. So, and we can classify the actions inside of the box with four different um, activities. D, I use D for decide. Somebody has to decide what to do in this case. Then the most important person is the executor, E. He has to execute an activity, a process. But he needs support. So I identified the people who participate in this activity, in this process. And other people should be informed about the result or of, the, um, of the end of this um, process to continue. Just for example, uh, we will start with a request of um, blood test. So the owner will be informed there is an important client who asks for uh, analysis. And the head of laboratory will execute uh, this request and will say, yo, OK, we can do this. And the administration will participate because they establish a file for the later bill to, uh, for the payment. And the client, of course, is the executor of this request, maybe by a letter, by an email, or by a, a form. Now, uh, the quality manager is executing a check. Can we do now with our resources this test, uh, this sample? And he will inform the client, maybe with a protocol or with a contract, Yes, we will do this test with uh, this diagnosis. Now we start with the sampling, how to get the blood sample. And so this is maybe executed by another head of department. 
and the quality manager will participate, what about hygienic conditions and so on. And then after a few steps, we have we will analyze this um, sample. And so we will have a raw data of the test. We will evaluate the raw data and produce a report and send the report to the client and inform the administration to issue a bill. This is a responsible matrix about one process or the main processes in the laboratory. And using this, I can um, describe a standard operation procedure in, let's say, two pages. One page is my matrix of responsibility. And the second page is connected <clears throat> as a flow chart to this activity. So if somebody has decided something, I have to write in my flow chart what happens in the case of yes and no. And so I can visualize the whole process with just these two pages, which give me a very short overview about the system in a laboratory or in the um, accreditation body or otherwhere, or in the quality system of a company. This is an example. <clears throat> this is a real uh, SOP, a certification of a product. And you can see what is the result. Again, you can see here the activities, the activities in um, brown color or in orange color. Um, so uh, this was just analyzed by the document, by the SOP procedure. And these are the chapters of the SOP procedure, application, inquiries, reception, requests and forms, and so on. And so I identified on this document, on this quality document, who is responsible to do a job. So I could see who is, will be informed, who is executing this, and something was missing. And so you can see the question marks here. So I have detected a lot of gaps inside of this quality documentation, the quality procedure. And now we can in, uh, improve the uh, uh, description of the process much more. So the main question is always, who is doing what, how, and with which result? <clears throat> and this describes the structure, the process, and the outcome. This matrix, the SPO matrix, has a lot of benefits. For example, this describes the process chain in a very uh, simple way. We have um, connections to the organizational chart, which persons in the laboratory are involved with, with activities. Automatically, we can connect the outcome to the list of records. And so we can improve the record management. And each outcome maybe is the input for the next process. So we can analyze also the workflow, how the results were used in other uh, processes. So we will have with this uh, process steps, maybe connections to the work instructions. So we can optimize the process runtime Sometimes there are so many activities which are not necessary by, because they are produced by bureaucracy. So we can optimize the workflow in such a laboratory. All the people in the working in the laboratory should have job descriptions. They should be well-defined duties. And we can also analyze the workload. If one person, for example, the quality manager is always active in each process step, maybe he's overloaded with work. So that's why I can analyze such a quality process, a quality procedure, maybe give me half an hour or one hour 
to detect also the critical points or the weak points of the quality process. But uh, there is a reality. So you can see again, the ISO 30001 says, managing risk considers human behavior and cultural factors. So I will tell you some of my experiences uh, in the reality. For example, the client. The client knows very well one of the employee and called him or sent him an email and asked him, can you just test this sample for me? I will give it to you uh, tomorrow. So there is not an official way how to, re uh, to reach, uh, to receive this sample. There is a, a, a short way, which is not quality controlled. Look at the quality manager. Maybe the quality manager has a dispute with the director. The director is always, uh, let's say, uh, not happy about the quality manager because uh, he has very cost in, uh, intensive recommendations or uh, requirements. Then we have maybe conflicts between the head of department A with the head of department B or with the head of department C with his administration, maybe by cost, or we have direct links between employees in different departments. Maybe there's a friend of one is working in another department. So they have a communication directly without the official way of bureaucracy. And otherwise I've seen sometimes the secretary of the administration is has a love is fallen in love with the owner, and there is a direct um, information of the owner about all activities inside of his laboratories with no filtering function of the director. This is a reality, and so that's why the description of the quality management system in paper is not the same how it's working in the reality, how it's working in life. I use number six, the quality tool, um, the iceberg analysis of non-conformities. So now we have detected during um, my SPO analysis, some deficiencies, some non-conformities, deviations, and how to do it and how to analyze now the situation. We have the output from the previous process as an input to this process. Now we have an activity, we need the resources, and we have the, um, the worker, Yuzu Uzu Ari. This will, he will produce or she will produce now an output, which will be the input for the next activity. And, oh, we got a complaint. We have a problem with our outputs. The result was maybe wrong or was not correct or was not uh, explained enough or was not that what was expected. So let's say we have a deviation in the output. Let's analyze what kind of deviation is it. So what about the gravidad, the locación, the dimension, the connection, the frequency, and the fuente. So we have different types of nonconformities, of deviations. The next analysis, ah, here's again, oh, I can improve my Spanish now. The classification de Alaskos. Uno, observación, riesgo o nonconformidad. Dos, evento aleatorio o sistemático. Tres, documentación y o implementación. Cuatro, nivel de riesgo, menor, mayor, crítico o K.O. Knocked out. Y cinco, fuentes, resultados, procesos, estructura, recursos, 
input processors, output or feedback. So with this information now we can analyze key and as responsible. So we look into the procedimiento of the manual de calidad. And who is responsible for this procedimiento? Maybe the projectista del sistema de calidad. This person who has planned the quality management system. And this projector gave an order to the author del procedimiento, please write a procedure about this activity. Now the procedure is written. Now number three is the instructor de los empleados. He has to train the employees how to use this procedure, this process. And number four, uh, the supervisores de calidad. They have to analyze, uh, to observe, to observe how this procedure is followed by the employees. Is it working? But again, uh, how is possible that we have such a um, deviation? Maybe we have to start with the projectista. Maybe he has forgotten something to order in the procedure. Maybe a hygienic expect, for example. Or maybe this was not written by the author of the procedure in this process. Maybe he has uh, put the hygienic condition in another um, document which was not connected to this procedure. Or maybe the instructor has not trained the empleados about the hygienic conditions. Or this was done, but maybe there is no discipline of the employees to uh, use hygienic requirements. You can see that this um, non-conformity, this deviation could have a lot of fuentes, responsible persons, and not only the employee who is doing the work, the analyst, uh, he's maybe just following the procedure. Yeah, and my last quality tool number seven is now the risk matrix graph for the risk evaluation. I will show you. This is from another ISO. It's a 22376, uh, from 2008, which describes risk matrix levels. So we have at first to look for the severity ranking. What is the result of the outcome of such a risk? Is it negligible? Is it minor, serious, critical? Or is it catastrophic? And the second component is the frequency of this risk, the probability that something happened. Is it frequent? Is it probable, occasional, remote, and improbable? As you know, I said, keep it smart and simple. These are too much ranking. So I reduce the rankings into three to three. What is the likelihood? Maybe it's unlikely, it's likely or very likely. And what is the impact? How serious is the risk? Maybe it's minor, moderate or major. And now I have nine boxes where I can classify and identify my risk. The green ones, these are acceptable risks because maybe the likelihood is likely or unlikely, but the, uh, the impact is minor. Or it could be the impact is moderate, but the likelihood is unlikely. Then we have acceptable risk, but in the yellow uh, boxes, that means we have to optimize the risk management. We have to do measures to uh, minimize this risk. And here, orange and red, these are the unacceptable unacceptable risk, very high level of risk, because very likely is moderate impact or with a major impact with likely likelihood. Or extreme risk, absolutely unacceptable, 
it's a major impact with a chance that maybe often will happen. Let me give you some examples. 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. And uh, why does it, was it possible? And so we have to look for the financial and political aspects. And the NASA management, the top management, ignored the warnings from engineers because they had a tight schedule and the budget. They don't want to wait much more to start the space shuttle because they were under pressure, economical pressure and also political pressure. So this happens some years later. Colombia, the space shuttle Colombia also exploded. And again, we have to look for the financial and political aspects how was it possible? And again, here, NASA management ignored again technician concerns about the extent of damage at launch. Again, the financial and political aspects have this um, risk uh, produced. And there was an, a side effect, the PowerPoint slides, slides, which were presented to the NASA management did not adequately present risks. So the technician informed the top manager about the high risk of this uh, launch, but they produced 120 uh, PowerPoint slides. And this was only one small part of the presentation. So the communicating was very poor uh, about the risk uh, results. Another example, the Boeing 737 MAX. Two disasters, 2018 and 2019. How is this possible? This airplane was developed under great time pressure. It was in competition with the Airbus 320. And the official regulators of the authority, FAA, fully trusted the Boeing management. They were a very powerful uh, company. And so there was no risk communication with the level of engineers and technicians, which has said, okay, this is not fully developed, this uh, airplane. And another disaster, 1986 Chernobyl, again, the safety test of this atomic reactor was planned for 1983. It was postponed to 1986 by the project manager because they got a bonus for timely commissioning. Again, we had the financial and political aspects. And years later, Fukushima, 2011. The in operation was since 1971, and the protective wall against the tsunami of the ocean was erected of 5.7 meters. But if you look into the statistics, we had a tsunami in 1983 with a tidal wave of 14 meters. 10 years later, with 31 meters tidal wave, and the tsunami who has destroyed now this uh, reactor was only 13 meters. All warnings were ignored by financial and political aspects. So if we look again in our risk map, we can see um, we have a risk evaluation by the technicians and the engineers. And they said, OK, we have material hazards, which are unacceptable risk. It's extreme. So the impact would be very major. But there was another risk evaluation by the financial manager, by the project or political deciders, because they were more uh, focused on the profit hazards. And they said, OK, um, the risk should be acceptable. Maybe we have an impact, a major impact, but it's unlikely change 
that it will happen. And this has produced the disasters because there was a gap in the risk communication. No ve ninguna mención a esto en su evaluación de riesgos para la oficina. I would like to make now a break, is it possible? And then continue. Ah, no, sorry, I got this at first. Um, I would like to make a short break and collect your chat questions. And then when we can continue at uh, in 20 minutes, is it okay 